Remember the Alamo. When you hear that phrase, that recalls a, a memory, a stirring inside of you if you were from Texas, to remember the great stand those men made many, many years ago, the sacrifice that they made that we might breathe the air of freedom that we have here today. There's power in memory. There's power in remembering events that have happened in our lives, even events that happened before we got here, that somehow fill us with a sense of meaning and purpose and courage. The power of memory. Today, I wanna challenge many of us here to remember a deep and significant event that happened in your life. And for others here, I wanna challenge you to create a memory that could last a lifetime. I would argue that one of the most powerful sermons ever delivered was delivered by a man who had just failed. A guy who had just fumbled at the goal line when everything mattered, this guy let down his leader. The man's name is Peter. Peter was the key leader of the disciples. Peter, as you know, denied Christ not once, not twice, three times. But after Christ was risen from the dead, he appeared to Peter, he reinstated him, and in days that follow, Peter, who I'm sure had been wallowing in guilt and regret, stood up and preached one of the most powerful messages in the history of the Christian church. It was all Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and there were people that were gathered in Jerusalem from all different parts of the world. And all of a sudden, all these people from all these different countries could hear the gospel being proclaimed in their own native language. No one knew what was going on. Peter's introduction to this sermon was this. Everybody calm down, they're not drunk. That was his intro. And then he goes on to deliver this incredible, powerful message about how Jesus Christ, whom they had crucified, was actually the Messiah. And how Jesus Christ, who was crucified, was risen from the dead, he had appeared to them, and how they needed to proclaim that he was the Lord and Savior of the world. So when they heard this incredible message, when they saw these amazing signs and wonders, when they heard the gospel proclaimed in their own native language, here's what they said in Acts chapter two, verses 37 following. If you have a Bible, you can turn to the book of Acts. If not, it's on the screen. So when they heard this incredible message, when they heard the gospel in their own tongue, when they heard Peter proclaim the good news, it says this, it says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Repent, which means to change your mind change the path that you're on, and then be baptized, which means to be submerged under water in the name of Jesus Christ. They're wondering, what do we do? What's the application? Change your mind, change the path that you're on, start to follow Christ, receive his gift of salvation, and to show that, be baptized, be submerged under water. Baptism. Baptism matters. Baptism is a big deal, right? We are second Baptist, right? Baptist church, which means we put an emphasis on 
baptism. Baptism is a lot of things. Baptism is an initiation. Like when you get into a club or an organization, or maybe you make a team, you have to go through an initiation. In a sense, baptism is an initiation. Baptism is also a celebration. It's a celebration. Last week when we baptized so many, many people and students at our beach retreats, people were shouting and cheering each other's name on, and, and they, they, it, was, it was a celebration of what God had done in the lives of those young people on our retreat. So baptism is a celebration. And yet baptism, I think, primarily is all about identification. In baptism, we are identifying with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're identifying with his life, we're identifying with his death and burial, and we're identifying with his resurrection. When people get baptized, pastors or others who baptize will say, buried with Christ unto death, rise when they come up out of the water to walk in newness of life. So baptism is all about identity. And as the gospel was initiated here in the book of Acts, and as they went out and baptized, baptism and trusting in Christ was one and the same. There was not really an option like, I'm going to pray to receive Christ, ask Jesus in my heart, but I may or may not be baptized. That simply didn't happen. That, that wasn't a reality. That would be like, I don't know, imagine going to a wedding or something and after the, the bride and groom, they exchange the vows and you know, they get to the ring point and, and the groom goes, you know what? I'm not gonna do the ring thing. Can you imagine that? I'm not gonna wear, I'm not gonna wear the ring. I, I just gave my verbal vows to you, right? That's, I love you in my heart. I said that, I pledge, I will, I do, but I'm not gonna wear the ring. I don't know, most brides, would probably protest that. They would probably give a little pushback. I don't know about that. Why? Because a ring is an outward symbol of an inward commitment. A ring says, hey, I am someone else's and someone else's is mine. I am in a committed covenant relationship. Baptism, in a sense, is that ring. It's that symbol where we step out publicly and identify with Christ. It's a public proclamation, an identification with him. So today, as we're gonna see people get baptized in a few moments, I want many of you here who have been baptized before to remember your identity in Christ. Remember your identity in Christ. Remember the fact that you are accepted and you are embraced by God because you are in Christ. That's your identity. Remember that you have been adopted into God's very family. You are a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God by your identity with Christ in baptism. Also, as Galatians 2 says, it is no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. So my identity, because I have been baptized in the life of Christ, has changed. I am forgiven, I am embraced because of Christ. He is my father, I am a son or a daughter of God, and God's spirit lives inside of my life because of what Christ has done for me. I have been buried with him, I have been risen with him, I identify with him, and now he lives inside of me. And that is who you are, if you've trusted Christ and been baptized. And we need to remind ourselves who we are. We need to remind ourselves that we are who God says that we are. 
Others of us need to respond to what God and Christ is calling you to do today. You need to respond. I remember my own baptism. I remember. I remember walking to a room. I remember what we talked about before we went out to get baptized. I remember having to wear socks in a pool of water, which I thought was strange. I remember walking out in front of a congregation like this and turning and looking out and seeing the people. I remember going under the water. I remember coming out. I remember what I thought about when I got out of the water. Though I was a kid, I remember my baptism. So my question to some of you here today is, do you remember your baptism? Do you remember it? Because baptism, maybe you were sprinkled as a child or had confirmation, but baptism by immersion is something that you should remember. It is a truly a watershed moment in your life. That God, it's a gift that God has given to us to drive home the reality that we have been forgiven, that we're a child of God, and that his spirit lives inside of us. Today, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to that and to be baptized as God leads. Last week at the Beach Retreat, I challenged our students. I said, students, young people, some of you are going to make a decision today that's going to impact the rest of your life. And I can say that today with great confidence. Some of you today will step out and make a decision that will impact the rest of your life. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of what we call believers' baptism by immersion. But right now, I want us to watch and listen to these stories of changed lives from our beach retreat. Check it out. So you're gonna look right in the lens and look at me right here. You see me? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. We're just gonna have a conversation. Don't worry okay. about the cameras. They're not here. It's just you and I. How about that? Okay. okay Can you talk about being a teenager in today's age? Like, what is your perspective? Like, do you think it's difficult? Do you think it's 
you know, and maybe some of the challenges that teenagers face today? Man, being a teenager is really hard. Definitely, I've dealt with my fair share of anxiety and just a lot of pressure, like socially. Parties and drinking, you have to face those every day with people trying to pressure you to. Did you grow up in church? I didn't go to church at all. I didn't really have God in my life. He wasn't a priority. Like I kind of just forgot, I guess you can say. I just never thought about him. My relationship with God has never been steady. Coming up, I prayed a lot. My parents worked, so we couldn't really get to church that often. I didn't really know what church was at such a young age. I had a relationship with God, and I was praying and all this. I never really felt like as close, you know? I always still felt a little distance. Like, I didn't want to commit to all the, the things that come with being a true Christian. I was, like, separated from him. I, like, moved him to the side and, like, went to go do my own thing, going down the wrong path, so we're going to his path. What's your relationship with your parents like? So, not great, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, me and my mom, we've always fought a lot. Never really got along. This is like kind of weird to explain. But me and my mom had gotten a really bad fight and it got to the point where it was physical. And so I got in contact with my school and I was talking to them about it. And so they contacted some people, I'm assuming you would know, CPS, DCVS, whatever. And they talked to me and they sent me somewhere to stay for a little bit. And my whole world just fell apart, like completely fell apart. Eventually I moved with my aunt, my uncle to, in Houston. I had the impression I was coming back home. My mom was like, oh, you're coming back home, but you're not gonna have a phone, you're not gonna have a car. I was like, okay, I don't care. Please get me out. I don't want to go back home. And the next thing you know, I get in my car and my whole entire li life is packed away. I get in the car with my uncle and I didn't say a word. The feeling of being adopted is just something like you can't explain because like you're very curious at like a teenage age of like who your real parents are and like why did she do that? In 2021, my childhood best friend passed away. I remember just sitting there just thinking, why God? 2019, September 1st, I lost, I lost one of my big brothers. Um, he was turning his life around, and he had just got baptized, trying to change his life around, which made me question um, why. I remember I was just, I was, I was a lost soul for a while, because that was, that was the brother that was always around. Earlier this year, one of my friends from school passed away and that was really hard. He was coming to school and he got hit on his bike by a car. It was a devastating time. Second semester of sophomore year really started battling with my mental health. I just kind of spiraled and I kept waiting for someone to recognize me or to reach out, but I think that I was so, you know, everyone's so good at just putting on a mask that nobody knew what was really going on. I used to have things thrown at me in group chats, telling people how much they hated me. For a long time, I struggled with uh, just alcohol, I think. That affected my mind. My mom and my dad was going had an argument, so, my dad was getting super frustrated with her. He pulled out a gun, pointed at her, and shot her leg and ran out. And ever since that day, I've been traumatized and sad and depressed because that really hurt me very, very much. Because I don't like seeing my mom all hurt and stuff. And I don't know what to do. I felt very alone. I felt this emptiness in me that I couldn't even explain to you. Because I've, I've experienced a lot of pain, but this pain was like so much worse than I, I could ever ex accept. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it was consuming me. The loneliness was consuming me. When I got older, I started asking questions that nobody could really give me the answer to. 
like I knew that he was there and that it was it was real, but it was just so hard to just believe that like he would take away the sweetest soul from this earth. I kept blaming him. It was more of a blame than it was like, why are you putting me through this? What have I done to deserve this? Like, I don't understand why would you put me through such hard times right now? And it's just constant back to back to back. When are you going to give me a relief? And then one day I just woke up and I finally realized I have to get up. I have to do this. And it was actually the day that we were going to church. They're like, we're going to church. You can't sit here anymore. We have to go. And so I got up. We went to church and I don't know, everything just like shifted over to me and I was like, this is it. This is what I need. So I heard that it was difficult for you to get to beach retreat. Is that true? Oh, uh, actually it was. Um, I, since I do have a single mom and she's a teacher, so we don't necessarily have the best income. So I did have to pay for half of this with my job. It, it was the best decision that I've made was was to be here. When I first got here, I didn't really know what to expect because I didn't really know any of the girls in my condo and I didn't know my condo leaders. I was nervous about coming here to Beach Retreat. I didn't, you know, none of my super close friends were coming. Um, I didn't know, you know, who my condo leader would be, where I'd be staying. I was just here to have fun. I didn't appreciate worship that much. You know, I didn't really get into the songs. I didn't understand them. My leaders just, there's something, a way they talked to me and it just kind of started to make sense. I started to listen to the worship songs and they really they really spoke to me. I know that any situation that I've put into, he has made me grow from it and he put me in that situation. So I know that being adopted was a blessing. I was waiting for someone like a human to come rescue me and meet me where I was. But like in reality, I needed a savior. I needed Christ. Putting Jesus on the throne of your heart instead of any worries you have or any anxiety um, is life changing. God can see a better future that I can never see. And I want to see that future. Do you feel like God's changing your life this week? Yes. You feel like he's teaching you things, helping you? Yes, for sure. And how do you want to be different when you go back home? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> to forgive. It's so hard for me to forgive people. Everyone is God's child, so I have to learn how to forgive too. Through this entire week, I've been saying to myself that I need to give God all of my sins and all my depression and sadness to Him and turn all that to goodness. I've done a few of like those prayers that are like, if you're ready to accept him, like, you know, say the prayer. But I think that this one was different because I know that I'm 100% ready to give my life to Jesus. Once I got Christ into my life, I felt this fullness in me that made me feel so much better. And I felt like somebody was actually with me and I wasn't alone. I wasn't going through this alone makes me feel so good knowing that you have someone like always watching over you, always like there for you. High school is really rocky with relationships and friendships and just having someone as constant as him, it really changes the way you view other people. You don't hold them to you know unhealthy standards and it also uh, gives you a healthy view of yourself and who God made you to be and it really allows yourself to walk out in confidence. Before I came, I was kind of in the middle of two paths, right? There was God's way and then kind of like the world's way. And I'm sitting there right there in between. But I feel like after this week, I can take home and practice these stuff we've learned this week. I think I'll be on God's path. I just think he's taken me from a path that, that so many people have that's, that's just wrong. And he's, he's corrected my path. I think I can spread the gospel to my friends and explain how he helped me in life and he can help them too. Honestly, now that I'm here, I can say that he did answer my prayer. He did answer. He got me out of that situation. He's doing this for a purpose. It's not to punish me. It's not to nothing. It's to help me to get better back on my feet. He helped me get out of this situation. And now I have to try to find the word for it. <laughs> I have to keep living it. I have to 
move on. I have to make more decisions based on his behalf now that I have him in my life. I want to get baptized because I'm ready to fully commit my life to the Lord. I remember I would always say, oh, when I'm 13, I don't know why. It was just when I'm, when I'm a teenager, I'll, I'll be baptized. And then, oh, maybe next year I'll do it. I had been wanting to, to get baptized for a while, and I felt like this was just the time to do it around this, this amazing community of people just worshiping and praising the Lord. I wanted to get baptized because I had a whole bunch of stuff built up inside me that I wanted to let go. I actually am getting baptized tonight. So I'm really excited about that. God has given us this incredible physical, spiritual, holistic immersion called baptism to really drive home the reality of how we are now connected and identified to our Lord and Savior. That's why he's given us this gift of baptism by immersion. I've been It's very comforting to know that he's just always right next to me. I don't want to wait anymore. I want to be proud of it. I want to show the world that, that I believe in Jesus. It was truly like an amazing moment last night, and especially getting baptized with my best friend right next to me. Jesus is my savior. He is in my heart. Now that God has shown me the way, I don't know, sometimes I just get these waves of like, like I feel full and I feel happy and excited and it's like God's with me right now. God is standing right by me right now, watching over me. Hallelujah.